Moving forward with the increasing interest in space exploration and the need for sustainable food production, let's give our undivided attention to Dr. Reji Kurian Thomas, founder of Technopilot, to talk about synergizing vertical farming and space exploration for future-proof agriculture. Give a, round, a big round of applause for Dr. Reji. Very good evening to all of you. I think two days of engaging talk on what is now. Uh, I had a small stint at Stanford, and because of that, uh, I was able to see what is going on in the future. I was able to work with NASA and several agencies. And uh, this presentation, this short presentation, is just a prelude on what we're going to talk about. So we're going to synergize uh, farming, in short, uh, vertical farming. And what exactly are the governments doing towards space exploration? And we will delve into some scientific, uh, technological, and commercial aspects about the intersection of these two uh, key areas. So we are, I believe, at a pivotal area in our modern history. You know, the farmers of uh, 1970s, 1980s, in the era I grew up with, they were actually the uh, AI. They were, they were the actual AI. They could just pick up the soil like this and say, yes, this much nitrogen I have. This is how much of NAMI I have, that is uh, the salt content, the EC. But the farmer of today has failed to do that only because the future is unpredictable. We exactly do not know what the future is. Nobody can, not even the farmer. It's because of this, because times are changing. The ecosystem of the globe is changing. We do not know the weather of tomorrow. In fact, the worst predictor of weather is the weatherman. If he says it's sunny, it'll be cloudy and it'll rain. It's been the laughing stock over the years I grew up with. So it is inevitable that we go to space. We have to look at alternate habitat. There's nuclear wars going on, wars going on full time. Nobody can able to stop it. Who knows what the future of the Earth might be? So this is exactly what the convergence of space exploration, what are we doing? And there's not that we have started work on this in the last one year. 30 years research is going on. Only thing is this research is not available in the common uh, parlance because this is highly classified. So let's see. There's in fact a lot of work which has gone on uh, by the top governments, the Germans, Russians, Chinese, Indians, Americans, several other countries on what exactly are we going to do. And I will also give you some timelines on what we propose. When are we going to have our first colonies in space? So as I always said, there's always a synergy, there's a symbiotic relationship between all parts of matter. If you see the, the sun, the earth, the water, the atmosphere, everything has to be in a symbiotic relationship. We saw several speakers, they mentioned that if the symbiosis is disturbed, that goes the ecosystem of the earth. We are not able to grow crops sustainably. So when the synergy is established, we can always say we can establish scalability. And that's the point of scalability. In fact, I talked to several of the uh, top-notch. We had, I was fortunate that several top-notch uh, people who came to exhibit and who came to talk, I was fortunate to interact with these uh, great minds. Everybody mentioned one thing about the symbiotic relationship between the microorganisms, the microbiota. If those guys are disturbed, that will be the end of farming. How do we put the food on the table? So this, I just wanted to give you some intersections on uh, something more. Fresh water, as we all know, is very much in demand. 30% of all GHG emissions, if you look at modern agriculture. And if we did not stop the exodus, we almost averted an ozone layer because we banned CHCs. In case it continues, 2050, the planet will become uninhabitable. There is absolutely no second doubt on this. And this, because of this, uh, we wanted to give some real world. Uh, this. Here we look at the ISS uh, space station, where we have an astronaut who's actually growing uh, uh, things. This was actually very, very long ago. Now, actually, we are able to do vertical farming in space. So several innovations have happened in space agriculture on how exactly have been able to grow and grow in scale 
in how we're able to produce the same sustainable agriculture on Earth, have we been able to do that in space? Now, in space, we have several options. One is we do it on ISS, uh, or space stations like ISS. ISS, you know, is the International Space Station, launched uh, several years ago, and there are always seven astronauts uh, in that, a league of 21 nations. There are several ISSs being formed by several nations. In fact, it takes time to set up these global laboratories. But there are other space habitats, like the moon, like Mars, or Pluto. So how do we prepare for these space stations? We have to look at research. We have to look at psychological research. How exactly is a human being or microorganism behave in space? We all know that astronauts, when they come back from space, they are kept in an area of confinement because their minds need to be adapted to what they feel will be uh, on Earth in the next uh, few days. So a lot of technologies are involved. We talked about all these technologies. Now, from these technologies of LED lighting, in terms of IoT devices, or let's say advanced aeroponic or hydroponic systems, I wanted to give you some real world examples in this uh, short synopsis. There are a few commercial leaders, and uh, we had Emirates One come here. We have several other companies, top notch in the world, who have established a niche in this area. And accidentally, I was talking to some people, they have stumbled upon some kind of research. The research which will be useful for our future. Respo research will be useful for the sustainability of the life of our future generations. There are several complexities in space, like microgravity. Here it's 9.81, but on Moon it is just one sixth of it. And in Mars it is 3.71, for example. In Pluto it is three, it's much, three times more. So what happens is, the first complexity in space is gravity. You will not get the same kind of gravity or the same kind of, because plants, the roots, they grow downwards, the stem, Mary stem goes upwards, the same kind of a periscopical structure will not be available in space. So this is one thing we have to look at. And this is one thing we have designed when we designed our moon-based systems. There's altered gene expression, even on Earth, because there's an extremity between the poles and the equator, and because of solar systems and cosmic rays and radiation, there is undergoing a genetic change which is happening in society. And in space, we all know astronauts, sometimes they grow a little uh, crazy when they come back to Earth. These altered gene expressions need to be factored in when we have habitat in space. Then uh, real world problems will be there. What you see on the Earth in the lab is not what you see in the real world. So microgravity is a major issue which we will have to face. And how we do that is the help of globules. And I will just show you a picture on how we've designed a globule. There has to be a centrifugal force which is there to counteract the effect. In fact, uh, if you look at ISS, ISS in 24 hours, they've got 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets. We just see one and one in our normal Earth cycle. ISS, all the astronauts there, they see 16 plus 16 in one day. Just imagine the kind of figure of merit their mind plays on uh, seeing light and daylight. It is very, very different. We need to have specialized growth mediums. Here we're talking about aeroponic systems, fine mist. We're talking about uh, people are arguing whether hydroponic is organic or not. Instantly, I also want to add, our company has been the first to grow bioponics. We develop bioponic products. Bioponics means this is the 100% organic way of doing hydroponics. Because if you do chemical-induced uh, products, there are a number of problems which you have with organic. Bioponics, it has been certified by IIT Delhi. These are the first products which are already available. So there are a lot of technologies, robotics, real-time uh, definitions, et cetera, which are involved in this. I will just take you straight away to the lunar agriculture. This is basically the abandoned mercury capsule. NASA astronauts are very much growing. This is vertical farming in space, which is going on. Uh, there's also a company known as Plenty. Many of you will be aware of it. Uh, they have also done a lot of work on this, on the traditional uh, farms. So currently, everybody is talking about population, 10.5 billion, uh, more mouths to feed. There may be a time, in fact, government, it's their duty, there may be a time in which we don't have enough food. And that is why the importance of places like rural agriculture is important. In fact, Chandrayaan 2 and 3, they have established the 
a presence of water on the moon. There's plenty of water around the South Pole. So all that has been taken into cognizance. Modular designs, blueprints, micrometeorites, these are all the areas that we have in space uh, which need to be really explored. Uh, these are the areas, a simple thing. The radiation is very different. In fact, many areas on Earth, they face cosmic radiation very, very differently. And plants, they are very susceptible. All of the uh, agronomists here will agree, plants are very, very susceptible to radiation and geopathic stress. If these stresses are altered and it gets a very good area to grow, plants dance and they give you record production. Uh, let's go for potential for large scale. Uh, this is basically the nutrient cycling and waste a technology we have in space. Anything that you have has to be converted, like in Earth we convert into energy. The same thing, we have these capsules are there which any waste is there in space can be 100% converted into something that is uh, very, very important. Uh, this is uh, basically the Germans, they're advanced. Uh, this is actually in space, uh, the space area which they created. It's the autonomous robot which is actually doing the plucking and uh, which is useful for insights on nutrient recycling and uh, waste reduction. This is how it looks, the outlook of food in space. If you see uh, 2025 is the first one, we expect 10 people to do this. Around 2035, there'll be 100. And 2045, there'll be 800 in orbit, and we expect 200 on the moon. Now, these figures are not hypothetical. These are actual real world. In fact, I expect, uh, based on my visits, uh, these figures will be multiplied by 10. So this is something very realistic. We are in that age and era where uh, doing something in space is not out of the world. If you look at some space food, some requirements, uh, we have to look at some safety methods, we look at waste mass, we look at micro-G, we look at algae, uh, what do the astronauts themselves eat? All these different, different areas. So we've broken down this into space farms. In space farms, we need something known as cellular agriculture. We need insects and fungi, algae, and indoor farms. These are the areas which are very important. Uh, then when we launch our fresh food supply, dry food supply, all this has to have the best outcome. If you look at space cellular agriculture, uh, we have broken down on how much of uh, cellular uh, material is needed for the human body. So we said 130 grams per day, how many input amino acids, how much algae, how much glucose is required, what are the important methods, is photosynthesis the same in space as it is uh, down below. These atomic cycles that you see, the atom cycles, like the carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus, they need to also work in synergy. Any of these cycles, they're closed loop systems on Earth. If these systems are disturbed, you will find that the system is not behaving. This is the atomic cycle in space farming. If you look at uh, the calcium carbonate and calcium sulfate salts, how they are doing, the air management, how it takes place in space, the wastewater, the recovery, this is nothing but a block diagram made, made to show this. This is the ISRU known as the in-situ resource utilization. This is how you take out gases, hydrogen, or you take out extant bases or CO2, and how you can use it. So this is the Mars oxygen ISRU experiment which has been done very, very successful. And this was for oxygen production on Mars uh, using atmospheric uh, CO2. This is uh, the Nirvana Alpha. There's a Martian uh, biomass facility which has been uh, developed. This will look exactly like this figure when it is being set up. This is basically the Martian facility, vertical farms. How exactly is the block diagram, the hydrolysis, the, uh, the habitat, the uh, fixation, the furnace, the gas tank, all this, how it will take place on Mars. This is, again, the Hadean Orgomas, it's called, which is for Pluto. This is a speculative system for the future uh, Pluto facility. I've just um, uh, drawn the different hydrogen reformation, the electrolysis parts, uh, the uh, crust materials, how they'll be synthesized, this is exactly how it'll be used, and how this can generate biomass and food. So as a summary, I would say that the day is not very far when we are going from normal agri to space farming. We have to take into account all these different cycles which take place, the atom, atom cycles which take place on Earth, very much important. We have to see how much of uh, percentage of energy that is required per person, and also the ISRU concept I had uh, sketched here, that is very, very different. This is the way for future. I also want to mention one particular uh, company, Caliber Biotherapeutics. Uh, they grow tobacco, but uh, 50 feet high. is phenomenal work going on because I had a chance to look at it. So indoor farms, 
uh, Brian, again, indoor farms, they need to be monitored and very, very tightly uh, coupled by technicians. And uh, that was the end of uh, telling you. What I've showed you is not speculation. It is not uh, Skyfire or Mars. This is something practical work which has already happened. But we don't happen to see that in normal parlance. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Reddy, for the comprehensive presentation and interesting information.